So first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give these talks about uh, an abelian uh, phenomena in arithmetic and uh, geometry. And uh, I am very pleased to be here in uh, New Mexico. Also because when I left uh, Philadelphia there, we had 28 degrees. <laughs> and here are some, uh, somewhat more. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, during Leila's talk, I was thinking to change my original plan for, the, for this talk, what I'm giving now, and to speak about, uh, about the GQ. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, maybe I will do that in the last lecture, and then uh, go on with the original plan for today. So today I want to say some words about uh, the birational aspects of the Annabelian conjectures of Grothendieck. And uh, why do I do this? Because this does not need a lot of prerequisites. That means what you have to know is only what is the absolute Galois group of a field and what is a finitely generated field. And since I am a friend of everybody who does analysis on stochastics, for me, the only fields you can really write down are the finitely generated ones, and all the other things are something which we do not talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that this question will come, therefore I take one minute from my time, and I will tell you I'm teaching an undergraduate course in algebra at Penn where I teach the people what is a proof. And then we were complaining now the last time when I told them about rings and factor rings and things like that, that this stuff is so abstract. There is no intuition to this. And I said, but what is more concrete? And then I said, well, what we do, for instance, in analysis is everything very concrete. There we have intuition and so on. And uh, I will not tell you the whole discussion because it may be wrong, but the final point of the discussion was and the following. I said, what do you think? The axiom of choice is something intuitive, or you have to give serious thoughts to this? Because the whole analysis and the whole measure theory and so on has, makes no sense without the axiom of choice. And they said, well, that's something very intuitive. And I said, OK, now do the following. Take all possible real numbers which you can describe somehow, recursively, in all possible ways. All the interesting ones are among these, yes? those which appear as periods, and pi, and e, and so on and so forth. Now look what tells you the axiom of choice, that in the complement of all these numbers in the reals, so let be x the complement of all these, the reals you think are intuitive, I agree, then the complement is something intuitive, and now the axiom of choice tells you in the reals you have, you have a way to choose a number in the complement. And I told them, okay, what is that way? So, uh, the word I'm going to talk about now, it's very intuitive. Okay, so. <laughs> Maybe this is somehow a duty exercise when one speaks about an abelian phenomena to start with a very classical and famous theorem of Atin and Schreier from the 1920s, and that says the following. So. Notations, very few notations, yeah. So K is some field. And then you take some separable closure of this guy and you denote GK out of KS over K. Call this the absolute Galois group of K. And if you want, this is the projective limit <laughs> over all the Galois groups of well, of all finite Galois extensions of L over K. Yeah. Where these should be understood actually in this fixed separable closure. And now because I just picked on the axiom of choice, maybe if you stay in a countable world, then you do need the axiom of choice for these constructions. <laughs> and um, so this is the absolute Galois group of K, and now 
this famous theorem of Atin and Schreier. As I said, maybe from the 1920s, uh, around 26 or 27, says the following. If GK is non-trivial and finite, then uh, K is real closed. Now, what does mean mm, is, is real closed field? Take care, not algebraically closed. What does it mean? Well, this means that actually K, now for those who, well, who learn first schemes and after that uh, what is a real closed field. So this means that K has an ordering. And is, uh, well, let's say K, ah, in particular, thus characteristic of K is zero. And K separable equals K algebraic. And this K adjoins square root of minus one. And uh, maybe you, those who did not do it uh, yet, uh, learn maybe from the algebra book of uh, uh, Professor Lang, what is a real closed field and this nice theory. Now, um, something one has to say here. What, why are these fields interesting? So these fields are interesting because their algebra and their algebraic geometry generalizes or is the same from the logical point of view as that of the true reals, if these exist. And the same as maybe of the real absolute which are, well, the algebraic real numbers, yeah? This is such an example of field. And, uh, yes? Say it again. Then the Galois group is not finite. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so, and uh, that was in the 1920s, and after that long time, nothing happened. And uh, so this is, I would call this the first maybe an abelian type result. That means from, the, from some information on the, some, some very specific Galois group, that means, first of all, it says that actually if the Galois group is finite, then this is real closed, and but is this. And what is then a part of the theorem here is, yeah, so I would say here in particular, GK is plus minus one, yeah? That means a finite Galois, absolute Galois group is not only finite, it's just, uh -huh. and then the field looks like the real numbers. And then Atin and Schreier tried hard, this is what I learned from Roquet and from others, try hard to classify up to isomorphism all the real closed fields. And then they, well, they gave up because it was really impossible, so the Types of isomorphic types of all the real closed fields, it's so rich that you have no chance to do it. Well, the, what we learn from this is that actually GK equals one, uh, GK, well, finite, is not something about isomorphic type of the field. It is rather something about the kind of algebraic geometry above, over this field. Yeah? Okay. Now, if you look in my notes, then I say, so from the topology, maybe if you look out now at uh, curve of, of smooth curves, proje smooth projective curves, so in the, well, over some field um, with K, say, containing the complex numbers, then we've learned today in the morning what it is, so these are the complex points of the curve. And then this is a nice topological space. And then if you look at P1, and I will write here top of X, which by definition is then P1 of Xn, maybe with some base point, which is not interesting now. Then this guy, what, so we know that actually if 
this does see something about the curve. And maybe say, so as I said, x smooth projective, maybe complete, yeah. It's OK. Then we know the structure. Ah, it's amazing. We don't know the structure of this after three lectures today. I feel embarrassed. So this, uh, yeah, so this guy is, uh, well, it's maybe canonically isomorphic to something gener generate with a1, b1, a, g, b, g, with the unique relation product of the commutators equals 1. And this presentation has some topological interpretation. Yeah? So this uh, tells you, so these guys are loops on the oriented Riemann, uh, on the oriented topological surface, x of c, say maybe genus bigger than 0. Well, I can play it gene zero, but it's not helpful. Yeah. Okay, and um, then if you cut around the well, the corresponding way around the handles, then you have this presentation. And what do I want to say about this? So, and then what is x uh, maybe algebraic of x c? Well, this is the com f completion of this. Yeah, so this is pi 1 top of x completed. And it turns out that here, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And it turns out that, uh, well, this is also what we something did not learn, but we can learn more and more. Actually, it turns out that in this case, the topological phenomenon injects into this. Yeah. So that means that it's called this guy, this guy is residually finite. OK, now a parallel to this situation, what do we see? Actually, the topological, well, the algebraic fundamental group does see something about the surface, but does not see the surface. What it sees about the surface is a kind of, it's a topological invariant of the surface, namely, namely the genus. In this case here, the group, a finite group, can see what kind of algebraic geometry does the field produce. But that's it, OK. Yeah. OK, now it took a long time until in the 60s. Now we make a 1960s. Yeah, so ah, here it's 1920s. So it was Neukirch who did the following. He was after a generalization of this theorem of Artin and Schreier. But now what does mean generalization? Now here I have again to recall the people, but unfortunately in this audience there are no people doing true analysis and, and uh, statistics and things like that. So actually there are only some, there is only maybe even, only these numbers are really true numbers, yeah? So, and then <laughs> these numbers, if we believe that they really do exist and so on, come equipped with something, with two fundamental operation. Yeah? And the point is that starting from this, you can define an ordering on N, and starting from this, you can define divisibilities. Yeah? And then when you go and do the all kinds of constructions from here, yeah, eventually you get to Q, and what this produces is something which is called the absolute value, and what these produce are something which are called the periodic values. Absolute, well, the periodic absolute values on, this is the usual absolute value. And then from here now the words. So this is the completed, the completion of Q with respect to this. And here you have the periodic numbers. And the artin Schreier theorem is a theorem about what are the decomposition, the general decomposition rules in the world of fields, which are of the same type as those coming from the absolute value of the yeah. And um, Neukirch, so it was, so now for number theories, actually these, the periodic absolute values are essential. And um, Neukirch was interested in the following question. Now suppose that you take a subfield of the algebraic closure of Q, well, maybe I have now different notations, and maybe I should not switch. I have somewhere here Q. 
maybe. Okay, so this is algebra explosion. And uh, suppose that uh, the Galois group of K is isomorphic to GQP. What happens then? Yeah, and then his theorem is, okay, then, yeah, then it turns out that K is actually exactly as in the case of the reals, is the field of algebraic periodic numbers. That means this is uh, Q bar intersected with QP. Yeah, and finally, what comes out from this is that uh, actually, well, at least the subgroups, so in the, in the absolute Galois group of Q, so consequence maybe, so question, so effect, which is a con con consequence of this. Well, if, so A, if maybe a group Z, so let Z in GQ be closed subgroup. Then A, if Z is isomorphic to the absolute Galois group of the reals, then um, Q bar fixed under Z, uh, under this Z, I saw this is a Z is isomorphic to the real number, so R absolute. Yeah. And B, if Z is isomorphic to the absolute Galois group of the periodic numbers, then the fixed group of Z is isomorphic to the periodic, the absolute periodic numbers, yeah, which I will call here, this is QP absolute, yeah. And, uh, okay, so this was the picture in the, uh, at, uh, well, in the middle, maybe towards the end of the 60s, but uh, an interesting consequence of this is that uh, now when you turn your attention to number theory, this has a tremendous uh, consequ uh, well, um, uh, consequences in the number theory. And finally, here are, so here there is no, uh -huh, I have to do this. I have to organize myself. Yes, into the, what? okay, now you say what, here we know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not, I mean, it's not just stupid the isomorphism. Well, the point yes, is, <laughs> is not stupid the isomorphism. That's one thing. Yeah. But, that, but then is it, is it an intelligent design? Yes, yes, the point is, You are right. Now. Yes. So it's an yes. Item. Yes. Yeah, but you didn't say it was ah, I tell you, I, if you allow me, then I say. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, so maybe I should not keep anything secret here. The point is that, among other things, this field has no automorphism but a trivial one. Therefore, when you write that this is isomorphic to something else, that isomorphism is unique. Now it turns out that actually the absolute numbers, of the periodics, have the same property. They have no automorphism but the trivial. That means when you write down that actually this isomorphism is something, the isomorphism exists. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> now I did not, so you said I should not keep anything secret. Now I, yeah. Okay. And uh, so this, this theorem of Neukirch actually is true also in a more general situation, so maybe I should say here, the point is, so what we have here, so I said, we have Q, we started with Q, and then you had here the reals, and it's something, well, it's tr unfortunately, the reals have only a non-trivial finite extension, namely the complex numbers, but the periodics have lots of trivial non-constant extensions, so maybe, so this is Q, P bar, 
So this is infinite. And therefore, maybe also one should, everybody should know, so this is, um, this has an absolute value, so there is a unique extension to this. But this is uh, not complete then, yeah? So again, maybe I do not, it's even maybe in the book of uh, Serge Lang that a finite extension of a complete field is complete if and only if, ah, sorry, it's complete. And an algebraic extension is complete if and only if it is finite. That means this can't be finite, and therefore you can maybe complete this then you get here CP. So that is the completion of this guy. So these are the PID complex numbers. <laughs> okay. That means this, well, over a PID field are many more finite extensions. And uh, this fact is also true if you replace it, not if you replace this group in case B, not as a morphic GQ, but just an open subgroup here. And yeah, so. Say it again. Any closed subgroup, I said. Yes. Yeah. And then maybe C, same true for open subgroups Z in GQP as follows. Now we have to say what it is, yeah? So then, uh, so. Maybe setting, okay, so Q bar fixed under Z over QP absolute is finite. Yeah, so maybe let's put it like this. Contains QP absolute and the degree of this, so the degree of Q bar fixed under Z over QP absolute is what we think. So it's the index of GQP in Z. And um, now the right interpretation of this, so what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequence is, so, um, let L, K be number fields. And, uh, Maybe phi be a given isomorphism of their absolute Galois groups. Um, isomorphism. Yeah, then what will do this guy? Well, if you take the decomposition places over the, of the group, if you take the, yeah, then uh, phi maps decomposition groups over places of K isomorphically onto the, so maps D here, the decomposition groups over the places of L. And what does it mean? So now now recall, so let's say maybe P is a place, so place of K, then you take all, so you have the following situation, here is K, here is K bar, you have here P, and you have some prolongation here, P bar, and then here you have the Galois group, GK, here you have the decomposition group. ZP bar, yeah? And uh, this theorem tells you that actually the same is here. So now you have and then Q place of L. And then you have the same picture here. So you have maybe here is Q bar, Q L bar L. Here is GL. And then the isomorphism maps this isomorphically onto this. And then it turns out that actually this isomorphism defines, well, what I say, maps isomorphically onto, that means you have a bijection between the decomposition places. But this gives you then a bijection between the places because the places are simply in bijection with the conjugacy classes of decomposition groups. 
Yeah. So since places bijection with conjugacy classes of the composition groups follows that phi induces a canonical bijection maybe phi defined on the places of k with values in the places of l in such a way that and now supplement maybe yeah so supplement um, phi respects these invariants yeah so e p well e p over p ah maybe i should say bijection in such a way that everything yeah you have here the places of q yeah so that the projection so projection so that this is commutative. Yeah, supplement. Now, phi respects the ramification indices and uh, inertia degrees. Yeah. So, yeah. That means E of P over P equals E of Q over the same P, and the same with the Fs. Now, we are in a situation which was studied before, and the people know a lot about this. Namely, such a bijection is called uh, equi arithmetical equivalence. So definition, phi is an arithmetical equivalence. Well, fact, I don't define so. Actually, a bijection with that property is called arithmetical equivalence. And now, if you go back already to Kronecker and so on, these, the old guys knew already that this has the following. Uh, uh, maybe I have to be careful now. Maybe Kronecker did not know that. <laughs> I will say in a second that. Second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, so this is an arithmetic equivalence, and in particular, if k over q is normal, then l over l is isomorphic, uh, well, l equals q inside q bar. Yeah. So what does it mean now concerning also the question which was raised? Well, the point is that uh, we see that, uh, so consequence again, if k over q is normal and uh, k and gk isomorphic to gq, then k equals l, G, sorry, l, then k equals l in q bar. So what does it mean? Actually, this means precisely that an open normal subgroup of the absolute Galois group of, the, of q is invariant under all possible isomorphisms. And then, well, since it's a normal open subgroup, then since a normal subgroup, you know that actually this is invariant under what? under conjugations. The question is, how far are such isomorphisms from being conjugations? And then, well, the final, the big, the final serious result here was the following, so theorem by several people, but maybe I say Neukirch and Uchida, and I will say and others. Because it was a longer dis conclusion, so a longer development. So let K L be number fields. Then every isomorphism phi defined on G K 
GL. So if there are any, yes, maybe there are no such as a market, but if there are some, then these are of, yeah, is defined by a conjugation inside GQ. So maybe again, so here a little explanation. So how do we have to understand this? So here is GQ and then GK sits as an open subgroup inside GQ and GL the same. And then you have the isomorphism here. Make it bigger. And I have phi here, the isomorphism. Then this is nothing but, may, ah, my diagram should be not like this, but should be like this. GQ, GQ. Then such an isomorphism is simply defined by, I have now to erase one of these, by the inner automorphism defined by some sigma. Yeah, so this is yeah, so there exists such a sigma, yeah. So here this means there exists and there exists a unique sigma such that this diagram is commutative, yeah. I not maybe this answers what you wanted to. Okay. So and uh, finally, so finally the same is true for all global fields, yeah. So finally Uchida showed that well but along the same line, so you need this story what was developed by Narkis. Same is true for all global fields. So that was maybe at the beginning of the 70s, and um, then nothing happens for a while until at the beginning of the 80s, Rothenlich came with this program where the, um, actually, well, what is subject of maybe almost uh, everything what we are going to do now, or maybe it's related to, yeah, to all these talks. And uh, then he said, uh, I remember now again that today at uh, lunch we had a discussion and I was uh, discussing with uh, Ali Boyum and the question was, are there accidents in mathematics or everything is a big picture? And Grotenich said, actually, this is not an accident. Yeah. He said that the fact that from an isomorphism of low global fields you can deduce that the global fields are isomorphic. That is not an accident. And that is, say, so the beginning of the what, of the, of what we call an abelian geometry, and this is also a term invented by Grothendieck. And an abelian is something which I would, well, it's a kind of negation, I think, for now from Greek. And uh, it's lyseptic and uh, as aseptic or aseptic and so on. That means something which is beyond the beyond a billion. Yeah. So yes. Same is true for all global fields. Ah, say what is true for all global fields. Okay, then I will say, uh, given K L global fields, yeah, and uh, given, ah, uh, I should not maybe exaggerate. I write it here. Ah, no, no. So, of 
global field is a number field or a function field of one in one area of a finite field, not in several. Uh, yes, it is true. I'm going to say. Okay, so this is what I'm saying here. So, okay, so. Okay, so again, Uchida, finally, yeah, et al. Yeah. So, L, K, uh, global fields. It is number field. Maybe function fields, one variable. One variable over finite fields. Yeah? Then given any phi, and given phi and isomorphism between the absolute Galois groups, yeah, there exists a unique field isomorphism, phi defined on K separable with values in, well, now I have to say L maybe in order to be KS, field isomorphism such that phi is defined by this. Now what does it mean defined by this? Phi of G equals phi to the minus 1 composed G composed phi for all G in GK. This assertion here, what is phi in this assertion? Phi is sigma. Uh, now maybe, maybe I think that I have to, okay, so you can replace here sigma by sigma to the minus one. Okay. Yeah. So this phi once again, in the, that case, phi is actually an isomorphism of the, the separable closures are the same as the algebraic closures. And then phi is an isomorphic of the algebraic closure, but it's an element of the algebraic uh, absolute Galois group. And then that's that the same. Okay. And now, so once again, so the idea. So uh, I'll say maybe one word here about at least write down. So growth index and abelian geometry. And uh, the main assertion of growth in abelian geometry is that actually this is just a first piece of information in a very broad picture. Yeah. So that is maybe the vision. And uh, said that, uh, okay, so let's write down here under. I have only 10 minutes and I want to bring it to an, to an end this, I will say, uh, so I will simply say dot, dot, dot. And this means that actually this is not an accident. Yeah, so this is much more general. And I will say, I will put here now the birational variant of this. So, and this is a theorem. So by myself, and maybe also see Spies. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the following. So let KL be finitely generated infinite fields. And then given phi and isomorphism between the Galois groups, a group isomorphism, isomorphism of profile, yeah? Then there exists a unique phi defined on the separable closure of L with values in. Ah, uh, now I have a problem. I have to say something more here. Yeah. There exists an isomorphism, then there exists a field isomorphism. Phi defined on the algebraic closure on L bar with values in K bar, 
defining such that this phi is defined exactly like in the case of global fields, that is phi to the minus 1 after g after phi for all g in the absolute Galois group of k. And now concerning uniqueness, unfortunately this is not very unique and you can't do it better because of the fact that actually you took here algebraic closures. Now the algebraic closures have lots of isomorph uh, isomorph well, have a type of isomorphism which is not seen by the Galois theory and namely these are the Frobenius. Yeah, so moreover phi is unique up to Frobenius twists, up to composition with Frobenius. Okay. Uh -huh. So the point is that these have, so the point is that actually, yeah, there is a difference between transcendence degree. So let's say k is fp of t in, uh, so it's a global field, yes, and so on. So global case. And uh, now high dimensional case. Let's say that k is fp, fp of t u. <laughs> So that is, so rational function field one variable, rational function field in two variables. Yeah? Now it turns out that uh, if you have any, so all the inseparable, pure inseparable extensions of this guy are isomorphic to K. Therefore, after composing in a corresponding way, you can suppose that actually uh, there you don't have to consider pure inseparable closure extensions. But not all pure inseparable closures of this guy are isomorphic to, ah, maybe of this guy it's okay. But <laughs> unfortunately, so if you look here at, uh, yeah, the thing, uh, this is a ah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, so you, I say if you take maybe k dash equals K adjoin what? Yeah, so it's some, some polynomial, yes. Exactly, yeah. So I don't know. T plus U. That's not a good. <laughs> exactly. So some polynomial, yeah, so in T and U. And if this polynomial is random, then this is not a rational function field again. Yeah. But from the Galois point, uh, theor theoretic point of view, these are the same, because it's only a pure inseparable cover, it's not seen by the Galois theorem. Therefore, actually, well, also in that theorem, the true theorem is that also there, so this also there, namely, this isomorphism is defined by such an isomorphism of the algebraic closures, but then by, by there is a unique, so you can, show, you, know, you can show that after you have such an isomorphism, then, ah, so, okay, maybe I should show here. What is the co consequence of this fact here? In particular, phi maps, phi maps Li, which is the maximal pre inseparable closure of I isomorphically to Ki. Yes? But now what did we observe here? So if these guys are isomorphic, you can't draw from that the conclusion that actually L and K are isomorphic. Because, for instance, this and this have the same pure inseparable closure, but they are not isomorphic. But it's not true for global fields, that means for fields in one variable. If, so, for fields in one variable, if these are isomorphic, then the fields are isomorphic. And then you just 
twist in this isomorphism, which is here, which is unique up to composition in Frobenius, you twist in such a way that actually that defines an isomorphism between L and K, which you can do. Yeah. No. No, because what I said here, I do make any, I don't make any claims between isomorphic types of L and K. I just speak about isomorphic types of L I and K I, which are the pure inseparable clones. Do you have an example of L isomorphic to K and L I isomorphic to K? Yeah, this is, this is, these are not isomorphic. No, but that's not a purely inseparable program. This is a pure inseparable, ah, this is FP, sorry. Ah, yeah, no, this is a pure inseparable. Really not closure, sorry. <laughs> I do not understand your problem. So these, this, these two fields yeah, yeah. have the same pure inseparable closure. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah, okay, sure. Okay. Therefore, they have the same absolute Galois group, but they are not isomorphic. Therefore, you can't expect to have a better result in this. Okay. Okay, so, because ah, I have to stop at 50 past? Oh. Yeah, that means I have three minutes. Okay, now, actually, from now, I do not know. I have a difficult task here in the sense that I expected uh, that Makoto will say everything about the fundamental groups and of curves, and then I do not have to say anything more about this. But, uh, so, my question is, do you plan to speak about fundamental groups in positive characteristic? I don't think so. My, my turn is just C1 minus 3. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, that means, um, well, yeah, I will have to completely maybe reorganize my. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the point is that actually I was planning to speak mostly about things in positive characteristic. And uh, there are such fine things like uh, pure inseparable covers. This is maybe a, such an example. And uh, I, w I was, well, I, in particular, I, would, I was supposing that actually the people are more or less familiar with fundamental groups of curves in positive characteristic. And uh, that they will be explained already in the previous talks, but this is not the case. Therefore, I will be maybe hardly be able to speak about proofs, but I will make I will give a picture then about what is known. Yeah. And um, so I think that maybe this is a good uh, point uh, to stop. Yeah.